Welcome to Washington Policy on the Go. This is David Bowes. I am the Communications Director for Washington Policy Center. And this is where we talk about the key issues of the day with our research directors and on rare occasions with special guests. But with the uh, November election so close and ballots dropping, we've done a lot of analysis of uh, the initiatives and we've released our citizens' guides to those initiatives. So I thought that it was important that we go through those citizens' guides so that uh, that you can make an informed vote uh, coming up this November. And you have the advantage of seeing our, where our initiatives guides are, what kinds of information that they have for you, and you can pass them out to friends and family who bother you and say, hey, I need to know what's happening with these initiatives. What's the truth about um, what is being uh, proposed here? And that's what these initiative, these uh, citizens' guides do, is they give you the facts about the initiatives, what's being uh, proposed, what the impact would be, and sheds light on uh, on what you're actually deciding. Because sometimes uh, the verbiage can be a bit confusing. And of course, uh, campaign commercials, this may come as a shock, but are not always uh, that honest and upfront about having a, a straightforward debate. We're going to start with our Vice President for Research, Todd Myers. And uh, Todd has done tremendous work on the uh, issue of the Climate Commitment Act. And of course, we're looking at the uh, initiative to repeal that act is initiative 2117. You know, Todd, why don't you walk us through, you know, what's at stake with, with the repeal? If people say, yes, they repeal this Climate Commitment Act, what would that mean? Yeah, so initiative 2117, it would repeal uh, the CO2 tax, which as you said, is called the Climate Commitment Act. Um, so I've gotten several texts and, and comments recently saying, okay, if I wanna get rid of the CO2 tax, how do I vote? And you vote, yes to repeal it. If you want to keep it, you vote no to keep it. And so that's that's how you vote. It's a little bit uh, confusing. You vote yes to repeal, but that's the way it is. So um, the uh, we instituted the, the Climate Commitment Act, the CO2 tax, two years ago. There's basically um, a couple of parts of it. The first part is uh, a cap. So what you'll hear is the, is the cap part and that, that there are only a limited number of allowances, CO2 allowances that are sold. And so for uh, organizations that emit CO2, and that could be an oil refiner like BP, which sells gasoline, or it could be the city of Enumclaw, the city of Enumclaw, the University of Washington. Um, there are companies that make semiconductors that are covered. Anyway, all of those who are covered have to buy allowances for every metric ton of CO2 they emit. And since there are a limited number of allowances, the price goes up as, you know, as demand goes up. And the goal is to get the price so high that people don't want to pay that price and it goes down. The result of that obviously has been that the price of gasoline, the price of diesel, the price of natural gas home heating and other things um, has gone up. Um, so the question is whether we want to keep that or not. The second part of it is the money that that generates. So when the state sells the permits, they generate new taxes. Um, they have budgeted more than $3 billion in new expenditures um, uh, using that money. And what you will hear is, is that it goes to all sorts of wonderful things. But as we've looked at many of the things that get that the money is spent on, um, are actually just more government, more bureaucracy. So I'll give you an example. There's about $12 million more um, that would be spent, that is budgeted, that would be spent on improving the forest health to reduce forest fires. That's a good thing. That's We think that there should be more of that. However, there's more than four times that much amount that is budgeted for local government planning for more growth management planning. <laughs> um, so, you know, what they will highlight in ads is, oh, we need the money to fight forest fires. But that's 12 million out of 3.1 or 3.2 billion dollars that is budgeted, tiny amount, and four times as much uh, goes just to plant growth management, local planning. And you see that again and again. Um, and so the other issue, uh, and I uh, debated Joe Fitzgibbon, um, Representative Joe Fitzgibbon, who's the majority leader for the Democrats, um, who was one of the authors of the Climate Commitment Act last week on TVW. And he said, OK, Todd, if we lose this tax money, where are we going to cut? Um, because we're going to have to cut roads. We're going to have to cut K-12. And I and that is simply wrong. In fact, 
the legislature, I asked him that there is a proposal, a uh, collective bargaining agreement for $1.3 billion in pay raises for state employees. And I asked him, are you going to fund that? And he said, well, yes, we have to pay our state employees. And I said, okay, that's fine, right? Your priority is pay raises for state employees, not for salmon recovery, uh, not for programs that they say reduce childhood asthma. So, you know, if the CO2 tax goes away, what they say is, well, we're going to cut programs that fund childhood asthma, but we'll keep programs that give pay raises for state employees. They have the money. It's just a question of practice. Yeah. And, and, I mean, there's been a lot of, um, even even in the uh, the statements that are now put inside the ballot, which we'll get to later with Paul Guppy, um, uh, you know, I, I just, I found those to be extremely biased, you know, because the, the assumption is that money's not fungible, that you can't just move money around. If you're a legislature, you decide what the priority is. And that's, that's what you're alluding to uh, there. But I wanted to go back to the asthma question because one of the things I've I've seen, I don't know if it's directly addressed in your citizen's guide or not, but one of the statements I've seen from various doctors on TV or people who play doctors on TV is that, hey, if the people repeal this initiative, then uh, the more people are going to be um, experiencing unclean air, more particles in the air, and there's going to be increases in asthma for the young and the elderly. Um, what what do you say about uh, how this initiative relates to that, if at all? So one of the big arguments they make is about forest fires. But of course, $12 million is not going to solve our problem with forest health. We need right. a lot more effort, a lot more work on that. So the the $12 million out of the $3.1 or $2 billion that is budgeted um, will make – it's not nothing – but it's not nearly enough. So to claim that, oh, kids are gonna suffer um, it is not true. The other thing is, is that, you know, the state budget has increased by nearly $20 billion over the last four to five years. And so they have $12 million. If they wanted to spend it, they would find the $12 million to do it. It's just not a priority, other things are. There are some other programs that would be in there, but it's important to remember that the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency says that by the year 2030, Washington's air will be significantly cleaner than it is today. So in 2019, they did a study, uh, looked at Puget Sound clean air or air quality, and, and it had a um, no change, sort of a baseline analysis with said with no low carbon fuel standard. And of course, in 2019, there was no uh, CO2 tax. And it said that air quality would be much cleaner by 2030 than it is today. So it it's, doesn't mean that there aren't projects that aren't that wouldn't make marginal improvements. But the thing is, is that one, most the vast majority of that improvement will occur without those programs. And second, if those programs are truly important, then fund them. Don't fund pay raises for state employees or reduce the pay raises for state employees or other priorities. We're talking about a few million dollars out of you know tens of billions of dollars in budget and tens of billions of dollars in new available funding. If they say, gee, we just can't find $12 million in the entire budget, I just think that's not honest. Isn't there, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't uh, many of the groups, uh, this kind of reminds me of an ad I saw on television where they were warning about billionaires being involved in the initiative process. <laughs> and, and then on the on the little paid for by, it was, you know, Steve Ballmer, the Gateses, you know, and, uh, and the Canauer. So I, I just thought, well, you know, this ad warning against billionaires is paid for by a bunch of billionaires. That so seemed a little odd, but um, isn't, Aren't some of the groups that are now warning about uh, the supposed link to asthma here and distorting, you know, the fung fungibility of the twelve million dollars out of the three and a half billion, um, weren't they opposed to a number of of uh, of efforts to better manage for us, if I remember correctly? Didn't well, that's the other that's the other ironic thing is, is that some of the money is actually going to lock up forests so that we don't harvest them and 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 leave them to decay, um, which makes them more fire prone. Um, now, a lot of those are on the west side where there are a few forest fires. But I was actually I'm just reading a history of the Quinault Nation um, and their forestry. And they note 
that there have been a fair number of forest fires, um, both on the Quinault uh, Reservation and in the forests around it. And that's where these forests are being purchased, supposedly to collect carbon, but that's not even true. But if you're worried about forest management and reducing forest fires, then you wouldn't lock up more forests that would become fire prone, even on the west side, where there have traditionally been uh, large catastrophic fires, although less certainly less frequent than on the east side. So it's, you know, they'll sort of make whatever argument is closest to hand. It's like, what do we need to say to get you to vote the way we want? And groups, it's very funny because there are groups on 2066, which is the natural gas ban, who are screaming now, it's not a natural gas ban. You know, that's a lie. We're not banning natural gas. And these same groups have been screaming for the past several years that we need to ban natural gas. But now that it's on the ballot, they're like, no, 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 that's not really true. And it's it's absolutely, it, it's ridiculous and tro- so transparent for those of us who have paid any attention. But, the, but what they hope is that voters who have other things in their life, so many other things that they're not paying attention. And so like they hear this claim, oh no, it's not a natural gas ban. They don't know how to sort it out. So it's just, you know, I think it's really, it's really been, I've been in politics a long time. I'm not surprised that people lie, but the strategy on this truly has been from day one, starting from the denial of, you know, increase in gas prices and energy prices and things like that to today where they're saying, oh, it's all about air quality and, you know, water quality, which is just absolutely false. Then we will cut roads and bridges, which is absolutely false. It just seems like the strategy is to lie their way to victory. Yeah, it's it's very strange. I, I, I feel the same way. Having watched things, you know, there's there's often exaggeration and hyperbole, but, you know, the central arguments usually have uh, you know, there's usually a difference in priorities that are going at it and battling. In this case, though, it's it's like, hey, we want to have a different debate entirely because, you know, we're going to lose that. We're, if we tell people, hey, we're not trying to ban natural gas. We're just trying to make it absolutely impossible for anyone to use it. You know, that's not going to fly. So something else uh, kicks in. And and that's why, you know, every day I'm treated to this this message that, you know, asthma will increase if if people you know, don't if people abandon the Climate Commitment Act and so forth. Um, but one of the other things that I've I've heard and I know you've addressed is that uh, this would there's no evidence that cost to fuel would be reduced if the Climate Commitment Act were repealed. And you know, one of the things they'll point out is you know, hey, where is your evidence that this that cutting this this tax on fuel would reduce prices on fuel? And then as the follow up to that, it's Hey, prices have already gone down since last year. So isn't that proof that this this really wasn't connected to the record uh, prices that Washington experienced on fuel last year? Yeah, this is the most, (laughs) this is just ridiculous because this argument is being made by, amongst other people, Rachel Smith, who is the head of the Seattle Chamber of Commerce. To To have a Chamber of Commerce president Arguing that tax cuts don't reduce prices just shows sort of how dishonest they're willing to be. She knows they do. Of course she knows they do. She argues that we should cut taxes and that that will cut costs for her own businesses. But somehow she's willing to say these things. And look, I offered when she said this in the Seattle Times editorial board, I said, all right, let's bet. Let's bet. Whether, you know, uh, one of the editorial board members challenged me and said, can you guarantee that prices will go down? And I said, yes. And I will bet you. I won't just say it. I will bet you. He didn't bet me. Uh, He was uh, Kate Riley, who's the editorial board editor, said we don't bet on the board. So, okay, I'll, I'll let him off the hook. But, you know, that doesn't apply to Rachel or to Joe Fitzgibbon or anybody else on the no side who is making these claims. And I've offered to bet them. And they won't. Why? Because they know they're lying. They know that I'm right. It's after the election. It's not going to impact the election. But what it'll show is is that they were being dishonest. And people don't like accountability. They don't like to be shown that they're dishonest. Betting is a tax on BS. And nobody likes to be taxed. So that's why I think, you know, betting about the impact of the tax is so clear. The best evidence that we know that prices will go down is that BP, which actually is supporting the no campaign, supporting keeping the tax, 
um, has lowered its prices. The price of the tax has gone down from about $60 a metric ton to about $30 a metric ton. And what did BP do during that time? They cut their prices, uh, the, the, the line item, the amount they charge for the tax in half. How do we know? They put it on their invoices. I have the invoices that they charge that show how much they, so I have literally the evidence that they have cut their prices and they're supporting the tax. This whole notion that if you cut taxes, costs don't go down is so stupid and so ridiculous. And it either shows people are completely dishonest or that they are willing to be gullible, uh, that they so desperately want that to be true that they are willing to be gullible. But I just think it is evidence of how sort of detached this discussion has become from reality. Now, look, we have a number of other citizens guides to get to, but I do want to tell everybody that um, I put a link in the chat to our citizens guides page where you can go and uh, and download the PDF of any one of our citizens guides. You can pass them among friends. Um, I did want to ask you one final question, though, Todd, about either uh, the citizens guide um, to uh, on the initiative to repeal the Climate Commitment Act 2117 or uh, the initiative to repeal the laws and regulations discouraging natural gas use uh, 2066. Um, is there something that stands out to you as, as you wrote the, you, you got the citizens guides all done, you've got them laid out as far as what, you know, what the, um, what the bill will do, what the arguments are, um, has there been anything that's popped up where you, you feel like, I wish I could add that, like one more argument that's come up uh, that, that you didn't expect to see where you wish you would have been able to insert that into these, all these publications, either one. I think that there's a bit of a whack-a-mole and it's more a, it's more true on the CO2 tax because what we hear every day is, um, oh, um, you know, we'll be able to fund this or we'll be able to fund this. And so you can't address all of those things. You can only say, look, here's the budget, here's what's funded. And a lot of the things that they claim will be cut simply aren't even funded, like the issue about clean water. Now they're claiming, oh, we're going to lose clean water. There's not a single dollar for clean drinking water or anything that would affect drinking water for anybody, not a single dollar. So uh, that's just nonsense. Uh, the one thing I am gonna write a blog about this week is green jobs. So what we're told is, oh, this will be great. This will help our economy. This will do lots of things for green jobs. This is what we hear all the time. But just today, um, the Department of US Department of Labor released its state by state um, unemployment rates. Washington is fifth worst in the country. We have one of the highest unemployment rates in the country. If these green jobs and two years of spending on, you know, from these billions of dollars were doing such great things, why do we have such a miserable record on unemployment? The other thing that I'm going to include are two graphs, one from Bill Gates' organization, where they track green jobs across the country, and the other one from the U.S. Department of Energy, the Biden administration, about where green jobs are being created. And what you will see is, is that very few jobs are being created in Washington State. Where are they being created? In the Southeast United States. Why? Because the business climate is friendly there. It doesn't matter what category, what industry it is, whether it's green jobs or anything else, businesses are going to go where it's, where it's friendly, where the climate is friendly. And so that's one thing I think I'm going to highlight in, in, a, in a new blog, which is the claims that these CO2 taxes and all these spending will increase jobs just simply are not bearing out in reality. We continue to have one of the worst unemployment rates in the country, despite all the claims of the people on the left who say that more government spending equals more jobs. That always reminds me of the habit that people have of assuming that, you know, if things are going well, you assume that they will always go well. And it's like, you know, if you have a brand new car and it's functioning really great, and you've never done any upkeep and never changed the oil, sure, it's going to drive for a long time and be really smooth. But eventually, if you don't do your, your due diligence and maintenance on that, there's going to be big problems ahead. Washington looks like it has a few signals, a few uh, check engine lights on that have been neglected for uh, for a little too long. They're too much yeah. like my car and <laughs> not enough like a smooth running car. Yeah. And I was going to say, and unfortunately, a lot of the political leaders are like me. When the check engine lights, they just keep driving. <laughs> My sister called it the genie lamp when I was uh, when I was a teenager. She said, "Hey, am I supposed to be worried about that red genie lamp that's on?" And I was like, "What?" 
<laughs> that's the oil light. Anyway, uh, hey, uh, Todd, thanks a lot for that. Uh, and for every everybody, the uh, citizens' uh, guides uh, to both of those initiatives are on the link I put in the chat. Everybody has access to it. You can download any of our citizens' guides, so all four of them there. And I'd encourage you to do the do show. It's important that people make informed decisions, whether they agree or disagree with Washington Policy Center's recommendations in the past. Um, the guides do a great job just laying out those issues and are well worth uh, reading there. So thank you, Todd. Let's uh, turn now to Elizabeth Hovdinu. She is uh, on the line with us. And you you uh, wrote the Citizen's Guide uh, to make the WACARES, participation in WACARES optional. That's Initiative 2124. Um, so tell us about, you know, what issues that you think define uh, this initiative. What do you think is at stake? And uh, and then I'll follow up with a question about what you've learned since. Hi, thank you. You know, 2124 would make participation in walk hairs, which is taxing all W-2 worker paychecks optional instead of mandatory. It would also, don't be confused by the ballot, which is a little bit confusing, uh, it would also keep the opt-outs that people who already have opted out of WACARES intact. So I think the ballot uh, language is a little bit confusing, confusing. And anytime I write about WACARES and mention the initiative, some uh, someone responds with, yes, get rid of this, this program, vote no. And it's a vote yes to make it optional for people. So that's what's going on here. My biggest concerns with WACARES, the program that this initiative would make optional uh, for people, is that it, it doesn't fit everyone's individual needs, or whether it's long-term care need, a lot of us won't have that need. Uh, industry numbers show that 70% of us will, but that means 30% won't. And people should be able to save for other life needs than just this one. Secondly, the Walk Cares program is set up to exclude people. It needs to exclude people so it can stay solvent and healthy. So, you know, I think it harms low-income workers by taking a portion of their paycheck that includes low-income workers, and they're having to hand over a portion of their wages to people who oftentimes have higher incomes and are not in need of taxpayer dependency or long-term care services. So that's a huge problem. Uh, the No campaign is busy saying that we can't afford this initiative, we can't afford to pass it because it takes away money away. No one is receiving money right now from law cares. They won't for years. Most people will have to pay in 10 years without a break of five or more years to qualify for the benefit. And again, this just speaks to the fact that the program is set up not to give walk hairs to many workers. It will give it to some. Uh, even some people who need long-term care will not get a long-term care benefit. Uh, this, this tax, this new payroll tax, of 58 cents for every $100 a person makes has brought in about $1.3 billion in its first year. And this money goes to state to the state for lawmakers to spend in different ways than going to the long-term care service safety net that already exists through Medicaid. That's something I think a lot of people don't know. This is not a safety net program, Law Cares. And um it's not based on financial need, whether you get the money or not. I think the government and taxpayers should be for safety nets for people in financial need, financial need. but creating a, a so-called safety net that helps people in need and people not in need is not gonna get us anywhere. Well, and that's part of, of presenting, you know, the, honestly, the program, which is, you know, it's a, it's a full-fledged program. You could, you know, if, if I were to ask hypothetically, if I had someone who was low income, who uh, felt like they needed some long-term care and they had one medical issue. Um, and then there was another individual who had say, you know, a few million dollars worth of assets, but it also paid into the program over 10 years and was eligible for benefits. But he had two um, qualifying medical issues that, that allowed for long-term care. 
it would be possible, correct me if I'm wrong, and it would be possible for the wealthy person to have the benefit and the less wealthy person to have nothing because they don't have enough qualifying issues. Is that correct? Ish, it's correct. Correct ish. Yeah, there. Uh, Walk Cares requires needing help with three activities of daily life, and those activities are listed. So everyone has to have that need, at least three need activities of daily life. And then there are health care, uh, I'm sorry, there are um, investment criterions that you need to make. First of all, you have to work 500 years for a qualifying year. You have to pay into the tax for 10 years, at least 10 years, without a five-year break. So this is ruling out the very caregivers in some cases that WACARE says it's here to help. You know, if a woman takes off time to raise kids, also takes time off to take care of family members, and the no campaign is clear that this is about women who have to take care of family, these people aren't going to qualify for walk cares. They've had breaks of five years or more in many cases. So it's a problem. Also, who, disqualified will people be people who can't work more than 500 hours a year because of a disability. We've talked to a few of those people and they're concerned that they're paying into a tax, uh, paying into a fund uh, that they can never benefit from. So this has uh, hurdles all over the place to disqualify you from care, but take in money from everyone for all of your working years. You're muted. Uh, sorry about that. I, 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 you think after you know five years, I learned a little lesson there. And being on radio for seventeen years, so that, I'd be curious to leave the mute button on. But no, trying to make um, the rest of us feel better. Yeah, yeah, making it. Well, I was looking at my voters' guide as you were talking and, and looking at Initiative Twenty One Twenty Four, and I just saw so many different pages before the arguments for and arguments against. You've got massive text and charts uh, and and other things. I know I'm, I'll be talking with Paul about about some of that coming up, but it st struck me that this this issue, which seems pretty straightforward to me, has become is is presented in a very complicated manner in, uh, in uh, at the ballot. And I want to try something new. We have a hand up by one of our viewers, uh, Gary. I'm going to allow you to talk, Gary, and ask your question. This is a new experiment. We usually just take them on text. So, Gary, go ahead, ask your question. Can you hear him? He is muted. He's letting, he's letting, I've, I've got him. Oh yeah. You got to unmute yourself, Gary. You're doing the same thing I did. You know, that's, that's on you. <laughs> All right. Is there an exception uh, under the Washington Cares uh, for cognitive impairment or do they still require uh, three uh, activities of daily living? I know in most long-term care policies, uh, they require two, but they make an exception for uh, cognitive impairment. I would have to look that up to remember exactly what's gone on. That has been discussed, and I would need to look up where they are at with that. Okay. So, Gary, uh, if you uh, put your email into the chat, um, uh, Elizabeth can get back to you uh, and give your answer after that. And thanks, Gary. I mean, you, this is the first time we've tried this uh, this approach, and uh, I like that. I mean, if you um, if anybody here wants to raise their hand at any point for a question, we can continue that experiment, and uh, and hopefully most uh, most future participants will actually unmute themselves, unlike myself and Gary. Can't blame Gary because I set the bad example right away there. Um, all right, so Elizabeth, uh, thank you so much. I know you're uh, pressed for time as we as are we all with our annual dinner event coming up on uh, Friday with uh, General Jack Keane and columnist and author Molly Hemingway, plus our Washington Policy Center research panel, including Elizabeth, will be up on stage talking about uh, the latest here in Washington State. So um appreciate that. I did want to leave you with one final question, though, and that is, is there anything that has come up 
uh, an argument for or against uh, the making of the Long-Term Care Act optional? Or is there something about uh, the initiative debate going on that you wish you would have been able to include in the Citizen's Guide that uh, perhaps was left out due, due to the time of publication? You know, I think um, I did include in the Citizen's Guide, there's an argument from the No campaign talking about how this will kill walk hairs and no one will have an option to be in it. I personally think that walk hair should be repealed, the long-term care law that created it and its payroll tax. But I do think it's, I, I'm not going to argue uh, with the no campaign about that. I mean, if enough people choose to opt out of walk hairs and choose not to participate it, in it so they can use their money for all of life needs, not just one that they might or might not have and might or might not qualify for, um, the, the plan will have to change. It will have to bring in more money. The tax rate will have to go higher than it is in its current form or they'll have to change it in ways that may inspire uh, lawmakers to repeal it, like I think they should have the last three years we've talked about law cares. You know, this should have never uh, taken off the ground. Um, law care should be repealed, and I think they're going to see that if they see enough people walk out. Uh, that this is not a program we're supporting and we need to encourage people to use their life wages for life needs, one of which includes long-term care and the possibility for it. The government can encourage uh, saving for long-term care. It can reform Medicaid, which is giving out long-term care benefits even to people who own million-dollar homes without having to tap into their savings, investments, et cetera. So- Million dollar homes used to impress me a lot more about- Right. <laughs> now you have to say like, even if they own two and a half to $3 million homes, you know, then, because uh, I, I feel like you could get a cottage in Edmonds now and, and uh, get nailed. Um, quick question came in uh, in a written form. Can you please confirm that the current funds being collected are placed in the general fund and used however the state chooses no, I don't think that's happening. The, the state, the funds that are coming in for this go to an investment board to be invested. Millions are spent on administration of the fund uh, and marketing the fund, uh, marketing the program. However, the money is going to the investment board to invest and make money on itself so we can uh, pay for this new entitlement for people in need and people not in need. You know, so I hope that answers that question. And they're actually bringing in more money than they thought they would, uh, increasing the uh, the likelihood that it could be solvent. But the, the problem is in the latest actuarial reports on this, in some cases, the fund is solvent for 75 years. In other scenarios, it won't be. And uh, lawmakers can always raise the tax rate, increase the benefit, uh, decrease the benefit if they want, or make eligibility restrictions uh, stricter. I know one thing they talk about doing is making the hours worked qualification for a year of eligibility to be 1,000 instead of 500. That's one way they've talked about making this more stable. Um, but yeah, the, you know, when, when in 2020, after the law passed, the state actuary, Matt Smith, said that we have a $15 billion problem, that there was a solvency problem because we did not pass a, a constitutional amendment in the state that would allow different kinds of investments with the money that was brought in for walk cares. But whether it's solvent or not, um, I'm not sure if it's going to be solvent or not. I don't think anyone is. There are projections and scenarios cast, but that's not the biggest problem with walk care. Is the bigger problems are that it's taking money from low-income wage earners and giving it to people who are not uh, low-income and who have more resources, and they really should be going after this long-term care need that's coming our populations away by reforming Medicaid, in my opinion.
And again, if you're looking for the link to get to our citizens guides uh, that was created by Elizabeth or uh, for any of, of the initiatives, uh, the link is in the chat section there. Or you can just go to WashingtonPolicy.org and go to the publications detail and, and you'll find it very quickly there. But you have a direct link in your chat. I'd encourage you to take that link and share it with friends, family. Um, if you don't share the direct PDF files or or web pages of the specific guides. A lot of people are looking for information. Doesn't have to be the exclusive information. Um, you know, they, we'd encourage people, hey, look at all the sources you want. Just make sure that you're also reading Washington Policy Center so that you can see the full picture of, of what's happening. Elizabeth, thank you so much. We're gonna turn to Paul Guppy, who uh, has been active in creating the Citizen's Guide uh, to repeal on initiative 2109 to repeal Washington's capital gains income tax and, uh, and of course, all of our research uh, over time. But before we get to the income tax, Paul, I did want to uh, just bring up the idea that I brought up with my, 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 uh, you can't see it because of these virtual backgrounds, but you know, the voters pamphlet guide where you have the government now stepping in and writing these, uh, these supposedly unbiased presentations of what, the financial impacts are of of these of these initiatives, and I wondered, you know, if they did this to a candidate, you know, if the the uh, the issue would be would be undeniably clear that there's the bias here. But instead, with the issues, we're we're doing something else. First, why don't you tell us, explain how this came to be, and um and and what you expect to come of it. Right. So to give you the background of what you're referring to, they say that. A good way to uh, maintain calm in your life is to not bring your work home. And I made that mistake a few days ago when my ballot arrived in the mail. So I'm sitting at my living room table trying to be a good citizen. I'm filling out the ballot. And I got to the <clears throat> uh, title description of Initiative 2109 to repeal the capital gains income tax, which is a statement that comes from the government. It's meant to be neutral, to just inform, purely descriptive to inform the voter about what that ballot measure is. And I'm reading the little paragraph and one sentence in there says, this measure would decrease funding, quote unquote, decrease funding is the phrase for K-12 education, higher education and daycare and social programs. And that's when I started yelling. So, you know, my wife is like, why do you bring your work home? You're getting so upset about these issues. <laughs> and so the point is that statement is absolutely not true. So campaign information has been saying that Initiative 2109, if it passes, would, quote, cut K-12 education. Even the Democrat leader of the Senate said that earlier this year in February when he was arguing against it. We wrote a fact check saying that is not true. Um, okay, I'll, I'll give you the facts. K-12 education, higher education, social programs will not lose a single dollar of funding if Initiative 2109 passes. The reason I know that that's true is that funding for those programs in the state budget has been increasing every single year for decades. Education funding is at the highest level it has ever been. And then projecting forward, the state is set to collect billions of dollars of additional tax revenue without the capital gains income tax. So if Initiative 2109 passes, the state will, number one, collect plenty of additional revenue anyway. And number two, those specific programs, education, daycare, social programs, will receive increased funding. That is virtually guaranteed. Todd said that he would bet somebody about the outcome of the Climate Commitment Act being repealed. I'm willing to bet anyone $10,000 practically. I mean, I don't know if I want to make that firm commitment. Well, sure, you know, because I know absolutely that those programs are not going to go down in funding. And even if the state were short of general revenue at some point, can you imagine a situation in this state in which the Democrats in the legislature would cut those programs? I mean, real dollar cuts. And we know that they never will. So when I read on the ballot that Initiative 2109 would, quote, decrease funding for those programs, I just knew it absolutely wasn't true. And then my problem is to try to control my emotions after that and stay calm, as I said. Oh, I, I had the same issue. I mean, I went, I went ballistic. I just thought, this right. is such a crock when you open up a pamphlet. And it's I, I don't mind if the argument you know for and against their bias, of course. I mean, that, that's the campaign's 
making their their arguments in a limited way. But when the state steps in and says, "Here's the neutral part of the of the panel," and they're making these arguments, knowing that legislators set they they decide where money goes. They set the priority for the state. The legislature it still has all the authority. So you know, even if the state ended up with less money, which is on no one's projected track record here, if the state was going to end up with one percent less, uh, that does not mean that anything would be cut. It depends on what priorities the legislature sets. And, right. and, and for these, for this kind of thing to be in the voters' guide, it just makes the voters' guide a campaign piece for mm -hmm. uh, for the powers that be. I, I just found it yeah. absolutely so outrageous. What, um... Yeah, yeah, to clarify what you were just saying is that the that information I'm referring to was printed on the ballot. It's not in the voters pamphlet. It, it's on the ballot itself, number one. Number two, our folks on the left and Democrats bemoan the fact that people, that there is less trust in public in, institutions than ever before, that people don't trust government, don't trust old media. But when the government tells you things that are not true, that is why the public uh, trust in our institutions is declining. Now I'm uh, even more bothered because I hadn't opened my ballot actually yet. Okay, so <laughs> now I know I'm going to blow up. I'm going to blow up a second time right. uh, with this. Yeah, uh, I don't like to. I don't like to open my ballot until I'm absolutely ready to, you know, sign it off and put it in the mail, which I I do plan plan to do uh, expeditiously. But um, it is this is just amazing. But let's get to the citizens guide now. Um, I do want to. I mean, ultimately, I think that. Um, I'm just shocked that this is a legal thing. I know they passed it. I'm just shocked that this is constitutional in any way, uh, this kind of manipulation of the ballot. You know, just, I mean, for example, I, somebody asked me about the income tax, uh, the capital gains income tax. I said, first of all, you know, we know that the, we established, Washington Policy Center Research established the IRS and all 49 other states and multiple other countries and even Washington state until very recently uh, recognized a capital gains tax as an income tax, and it's in the name, right? A gain is income, not transaction. It's income, right. and then it's decided by your uh, your your near your income tax papers. So um, it's, it's it's beyond dispute, except in Washington. But Washington State has rejected income taxes of any kind, you know, throughout you know since the 1930s. Ten rejections, including constitutional amendments, including taxes on the rich. But this will be the first time that an income tax is called something else. You know, it's called an excise tax. It's not identified as an income tax, despite the emails that we uncovered showing that this is exactly what they wanted, you know, verbal camouflage to get what, what, what they wish. Uh, we have one person who's asked this question on the chat. Is it true some legislators are already proposing a reduction in the threshold of the capital gains tax? That's answered in the citizen's guide in the affirmative there. But this will be the first time voters have... have um, you know, I've been faced with a question that's not really the right question. I mean, it's not an, not entirely accurate. And so, you know, I, I have no predictions, but I, I found that to be troubling as, as well. And the voter's guide, you know, I know you identify it as an income tax, but do you find, you know, in, in your experience, is this, um, you know, I, I guess we're just in uncharted territory. I'm not sure how to, how to, uh, how to respond to that. Sure. So a little bit of background is it took the Democrats three years to put this tax in place. <clears throat> and the reason for that is because it's highly unpopular. As you noted, people of our state have rejected a state income tax uh, 10 times over the years uh, on the ballot. And so the Democrats knew that they had to avoid that pitfall. They So they created a narrative, a cover story, by claiming that this tax is, number one, a tax on the rich, and number two, an excise tax on the transaction of earning capital gains on investments. That is a complete fairy story. Um, but the, 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 and the lower court, uh, when it ruled on this bill that the legislature passed as being unconstitutional uh, because an inc a graduated income tax is not allowed under our constitution, that's very clear. You mentioned all the background research that we did to demonstrate that. That was used in court. And the lower court judge, as I said, agreed with that because he used English and common sense to read the Constitution and then read the bill, put the two together, and he struck down the capital gains tax as an as an unconstitutional income tax. But the Democrats didn't give up there. They appealed it to the Supreme Court. <clears throat> they
they actually skipped the appeals court level and went dr directly to the state Supreme Court. And the state Supreme Court played a word game in which they said it's not a quote income tax, it's an excise tax. In other words, a tax on the transaction of earning income, which is clearly just a game. And because this is has to do with kind of obscure IRS rules, the general public doesn't really get that. And I understand that. But that's why we have judges in order to be neutral and, and fair, read what the law says and apply it to a particular case. And in this case, our corrupt Supreme Court had clearly already decided that they were going to confirm this tax and they were just looking for a word game to get it done. And, and that's what happened. Uh, but of course, direct democracy pushed back against that, and we end up with a popular citizens initiative that is now seeking to repeal this tax, Initiative 2109. You mentioned the citizens guide that I wrote. Um, it is called a tax on the rich, but I think most people understand, uh, in answer to the question that was asked, that the threshold, the dollar threshold at which you pay the tax will be gradually lowered until it hits the average person. And then it's not too much of a leap to realize, well, we're not going to tax just capital gains income. We're going to tax your earned income, just your regular paycheck. And then we'll be right exactly where about 40 other states are. We'll just be yet another state that has a, its own income tax. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's been very frustrating. And, and I want to point out when you say you know the Democrats were moving for something, you're talking about there was majority Democrats and it was literally I mean, that was the only party that was that was doing it. It's not a sense of it's not every Democrat, but it was right. Democrats that yeah. were moving in that direction. Right. Yeah, you're right. I mean, we, we wouldn't say that unless the voting record was clear that every Republican voted against it. I think there might have been a few Democrats who voted against it, too. But the majority passed it in the legislature and then uh, Governor Inslee signed it. And so, uh, again, the link to all of our citizens' guides is uh, in your chat right now. Uh, it's easily found on our homepage. If you go to the read section and scroll down to uh, research, it's right there at the top. You can share this information with people, especially those looking for some clear and concise, the facts laid out about what this is. And again, as always, we don't discourage you. Other people will say, ignore Washington Policy Center, don't look what they have. You know, we don't do that. We say, go ahead and read everything that other people have. Just make sure you also read our stuff so you get the full picture and you get the layout and the context that you need to make an informed decision. I hope you'll do that and read uh, our citizens' guides. Uh, Paul, thanks so much for your time today. I appreciate that. And to uh, each of our research uh, center directors who came on the show, Washington Policy on the Go will be back in uh, two weeks. And I also want to remind you our annual dinner event is in Bellevue this Friday with General Jack Keane and uh, columnist Molly Hemingway of The Federalist. Um, it's going to be an exciting event. If uh, there might be, I think registration might have just closed, but you might be able to get a ticket. You have to check WPCDinner.com. That's WPCDinner.com uh, for details there. Um, and uh, wish you luck. And I hope we see you there. Uh, and we're looking forward. Oh, and also after the election, we have a post election event uh, in the South Sound. Uh, some analysis of what what do we do after the election? When the election's all said and done, what are we going to do? We've got a new event uh, that's up on our website on the event page. Just go to WashingtonPolicy.org, go to the events page, and you'll see our South Sound event uh, right there um, that's happening after the election. I will try and grab real quickly that um, that link for you here in um, – because that's going to be a really important one. Regardless of what happens after the election, uh, we have – there's there's we have work to do in washington state and we can't uh, we can't shirk that duty so that is also in your chat for everybody if you want to participate in the south sound event it's post-election policy and pizza uh, todd myers charles prestrude elizabeth new and mark harmsworth will all be there to talk about what comes next uh, so looking forward to seeing you there and a special thanks to our event a sponsor absher construction so uh, come and join us there in the South Sound, and that's at the Station House 726 in Puyallup. So looking forward to seeing you there. See you in two weeks here in Washington Policy on the Go, and, uh, and of course, on Friday at the annual dinner. Thank you so much for joining us today.